Welcome back to the house of God tonight. Let's stand and let's sing to Christ. Come thou fount, come thou king, come thou precious prince of peace. Let's sing out to Jesus tonight. All right, church fam, on that first stanza. Come thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace. Strings of mercy never ceasing, songs for songs. Behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the King, the mystery of the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll sing this to the Lord right now. Come behold, everyone singing it on that verse. Come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the King. Be the thing.
good singing this evening and welcome back for round two here at Liberty Baptist Church. And I like that song. I enjoy the, the doctrine and the lyrics of that song. Come behold the wondrous mystery that the, the king of life would die for us. And what a blessing it is to know God. And, and thank you for a good day today. I enjoyed church together with God's people this morning. And to the singer, we were in Genesis. How many of you took your pastor's advice and you got some creation rest this afternoon? Let me just see. A few of you. I, I, want, I don't want to be one thing in the pulpit and one thing at home. So I practiced what I preached today, all right? I went home and took a nap. And uh, we talked this morning about the example that God gave us in rest. And to, to work in the healthy rhythms in our lives. But then also not just physical rest, but the spiritual rest we find in Christ. Come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You'll find rest unto your souls. And I trust that in our Christian lives, we're not in that spiritual rat race, but truly resting in the finished work of Christ and working from that. And I knew that, I, I, I've preached and I know that we gather on the first day of the week to celebrate the resurrection of Christ, and it's the example in the New Testament. But I, I don't know that I ever quite thought about that thought that the Lord gave as I studied this week. And uh, that in the Old Testament, it was work, 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 and then rest. They were working toward their rest. For the believer, we're working from the work, where, where all that we do is coming from the finished work of Christ. And so we gather on Sunday, and, and we're in, in that redemption rest, and then the rest of our Christian lives flow from that. And sometimes people might say, what's the big, that seems, well, those are semantics, we're still supposed to do the right things. But our motives matter, why we do what we do matters, our relationship matters. In the Christian life, it's not supposed to be an outside in. I do these things because I have to. No, uh, these are fruits that flow from an inner relationship with our Lord. And so I've been, I enjoyed the opportunity this morning to open God's Word, and I'm excited about the message this evening. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, I thank you for your church and for your people. God, most of all, I thank you for who you are in our lives. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving us so much that you sent your son, Jesus, to die for us. We thank you for the spirit that lives within us to comfort, to challenge, to convict, to, to show us when we're going astray. Lord, I thank you for a church family and for friends and others. And God, I think of those that are not here today. I know of several that are home for one reason or another and maybe are watching online. For those that are watching, I pray a blessing upon them. And God, I, I pray for those that, that are walking through different things that, Lord, as we, we sang this morning, that when you give and when you take away, our hearts will choose to say, blessed be your name. Help now this service to bring honor and glory to you, and may it speak to each one of our hearts. May your word challenge us and help us, equip us, is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. As you're seated there, uh, the ushers will come through. If we've missed the kiddos with a children's outline, sixth grade and below, uh, we'll get that passed out to you. And I do want to make mention of just a couple of quick announcements I mentioned this morning, I'm excited for you uh, next Sunday morning. I hope you'll plan to be in church in your spot. And it's rare that Pastor Sammy preaches in the English service on Sundays. I think, Pastor, I said this morning, Pastor Sammy, it's probably been a year or two. Is that right? Or has it probably been a year or two since you preached? Maybe during COVID and we had the shutdown or something. But it's not too often. Of course, he's preaching in Spanish um, every Sunday. But I've asked him, I, and I told the church, I don't like missing Sundays at Liberty. Generally, I take about two Sundays a year for our family with different uh, time with our family and usually one or two Sundays on a missions trip or an international trip of some sort um, with missions work and then about one or two Sundays um, if there's a church that has a special event or, um, or something of that nature where I feel that maybe I could be a blessing and a help and an encouragement in that church and maybe they would be the same where it would sharpen me as a pastor and, and uh, generally I take one or two of those meetings and next Sunday is one of those I'll be preaching here in Southern California about an hour away, a young pastor that's come to a church and really a revitalization project and God's really blessed in some amazing ways and they have a special building banquet on Saturday and then I'm preaching on Sunday as well. I'll be with them for the weekend. And so I hope you'll be back on Sunday morning. Invite folks to join you and, uh, and you'll be blessed as Pastor Sammy preaches and we have uh, one of our men that, that will be preaching in the Spanish service as well and excited about the day next Sunday. And uh, two weeks from today is Memorial Day weekend. And we're going to have our morning service at 10. And I've said if you want to come to church, maybe dress a little more comfortably or bring a change of clothes. 
about five minutes away, Bonita Canyon Park. Uh, we'll have grills available there, and we'll have some different games and things set up. And just an opportunity for church fellowship. It'll be a modified service schedule on that day. And the church fellowship Memorial Day barbecue will take the place of our evening service. We'll be together probably longer together on that Sunday than we normally would be with our two services. We'll be together from the morning and until that um, fellowship time ends. But uh, we'll look forward to that time together on Sunday afternoon. So if you'd like to bring some food um, to, for your family and, and, uh, and bring those things. And we'll look forward to that time together with the church family. And I'm looking uh, forward to that. Also, a week from this Wednesday is our school graduation and the kindergarten at 5 o'clock, 8th grade and 12th grade graduations at 7 o'clock. And, uh, and so school, this is our last full week of school for the school year here, and we're excited about those graduation services. I mentioned this morning, Jenna Nepomuceno, welcome home. Good to have you back. Graduated this past week at Pensacola Christian College, and we're happy for you and excited for you and proud of you. And I don't think any of our out-of-town, other out-of-town college students are back in town. I saw also Susanna Smith graduated this past week. I saw pictures on Facebook from Bob Jones University, and I'm trying to think um, if there's anybody else graduating that I've seen pictures of, but they'll be coming back in in the next week or two, and we're excited about that. But this time we're going to get ready. Is it a duet? Is that what we're doing? Trio. You, Daryl, Andy, and Janine. Is that what we're doing? And uh, Daryl, I don't know if we really like Daryl very much. Daryl's going to be moving out of California. And this is the last Sunday that we'll be here together. He's going to be with you all next Sunday, but I'll be out preaching. And so Daryl and Yoli, uh, they've been, and their daughter Lana, she's graduating eighth grade. They'll be here through school graduation. And then Daryl has taken with his position with AAA and is relocating to Texas there. He'll be, his work and his office and things, they've asked him and he's going to be moving there. And uh, I've known Daryl, we've known each other since we were teenagers. We were in Bible college together. I think, was it the first year of the college you came, Daryl, the second year? First year, we were dorm mates. And uh, were you with Tom? Were you a roommate with Tom yeah, that year? So the, the house, yeah, we were, they didn't have dorms, it was a, a brand new Bible college, and so they rented a house, a, I think it was a four bedroom house, and they put 16 or 18 guys in there, <laughs> which is probably the cleanest thing you've ever seen. And what, is that right? Pretty clean? <laughs> there were things growing all over that house. We don't know what they were. But you go and put 16 or 18, 18 year olds in a four bedroom house and see what happens. I don't, I don't remember the exact number, but it was definitely, they had, uh, I, we were in rooms and they had like four, two or three bunk beds in the living room and, and we were having a good time. And so Daryl and I were our freshman year of college together and, and, uh, and then the Lord had moved him here before the Lord moved us here. And we came, my wife, and I'm not sure that we had kept in contact, I don't, I don't know that I knew you were serving at Liberty, and the Lord brought us down in 2015, and I was here, and I said, oh, Daryl, one of a friend, we were intramural sports and different things, served the Lord together, and uh, God had their family, and they were really probably one of just a handful, five or less families that I had any idea who any of the people of Liberty Baptist Church were, and, and from the beginning, Daryl and his wife have been such a faithful encouragement and testimony. He's taught our children in Sunday school. He's been a huge part of our children's team. And I was probably teaching, were you teaching this morning in the kids' ministry? And served in the choir. We're going to need a loud male voice to replace Daryl up in the choir, all right, folks? And uh, has helped to direct the choir when different choir directors have been out of town. And uh, Daryl just has a joyful, faithful spirit about the Lord and has been a wonderful servant. We're going to miss him here. And Daryl, as your friend, and now the opportunity the last seven years to be your pastor, you've been nothing but a joy to me and to my wife. It's been an honor to serve with you guys the last seven years. And uh, you get one more Sunday to say goodbye to them, but this is the last Sunday that we'll be here together, and we're going to miss you guys. Looking forward to hearing you sing tonight.
Praise the Lord, Christ our King. Thank God for that. Let's stand, church, and let's worship the Lord. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die. But he did both. Let's say amen for such a word as I. Alas, and did my Savior God's own son, precious lamb of God, Messiah, holy one. There is a redeemer. Sing it, church. There is a redeemer. Jesus, God's own son, precious lamb.
Thank you, Pastor Sammy. You can be seated there. And as you're seated, would you turn with me to Exodus chapter number 32. Exodus chapter number 32. When I sat down, Pastor Sammy said, he just said about Daryl, he said he's just a, a faithful servant. He's a good man, isn't he? And you know, it's a good thing if and when the Lord leads us away, whether by death or relocation, for people to be able, for us to have a good testimony when we leave. And if when God calls us home or leads us to another place for us uh, for folks to, to actually miss us. That's a good thing. And that takes years to build, doesn't it? And uh, thankful for the many faithful, godly folks that are a part of our church family. Many of you might be like me. I hate to wait, don't you? I hate waiting for things. I don't like waiting at stoplights. And while I'm waiting at stoplight, I'm constantly looking at the other one to see if it's turning yellow and figuring out timing it. My son was telling me, I guess there's a uh, some new cars or some new systems that it can tell you on your on your screen how many seconds until the next stoplight till it turns. Anybody have a car that does that? That's a part of your your car. Not yet. I don't know. I've, my son saw it somewhere. But uh, I hate sitting in traffic. I don't like waiting in line at the grocery store. And uh, we'll we'll do things where we, if we're if I'm at the store together, I'll say, okay, honey, you wait in that one. I'll wait in this one, and then we'll just see who gets there first. Because those extra three minutes are going to change my whole day, I guess. But that's how I am. I don't like to wait. I get frustrated. I don't know about you. We get frustrated when a waiter takes 15 minutes extra, a little too long to bring our food to us. And uh, we can get frustrated by that. When, when a doctor, uh, we have an appointment with a doctor and they're a half an hour late, we get frustrated by that. Amazon, God forbid, is a day late on their two-day prime delivery. Oh, man, we're, we're on the phone, aren't we? We're checking. Where is that? Where is my delivery? And now it's one day and some of it's same day. And uh, Amazon, pretty soon you're just going to click, push click and it'll arrive right there at your doorstep. And uh, I don't like waiting. Burger King famously used the slogan, have it your way, what? Nobody knows the Burger King slogan? Have it your way, right away. Man, you don't remember that? I'm the only one that watched TV? Okay. And uh, okay, that well, Burger, trust me, Burger King had a slogan that was have it your way, right away. And... Uh, we want, we want everything our way when we want it. Give it to us our way or get out of our way. We want it right now. We want what we want when we want it. We don't want to have to wait for anything. You go to the grocery store now. Everything is prepackaged. I don't want to have to wait to put a salad together. Give me my salad in a bag. I want to have a bag, open it and pour it out. And there's my salad. TV dinners. I don't want to put it together or whatever it is. I want it in a box. I want those things. And this evening... I want to bring a message to you. In this series, I've entitled Counseling Classics. These are principles or messages, passages. In fact, just this week in a counseling session with a person that's come to our church, I think, three or four times and is really seeking, trying to find answers spiritually and seeking uh, for salvation and looking for something. A sweet, sweet lady. She was in church sitting right over here this morning. And she's been, I think, this morning was her fourth time to visit. And in that counseling session this week, I pointed her to one of the messages that I recently preached. I said, and these are passages, passages where things that often come up in personal counseling as a pastor. Um, and I, I had the idea sometime last year for a series of Sunday nights, I'm going to preach those passages or preach those messages. One, because if it's coming up over and over again in counseling, probably it would be a help to many of us. And two, so that I have that resource on our website or on our podcast where I can say, as I did this week, I'd encourage you to go listen to this message on that subject. I think that would really help you. And so that's where this comes from. But how many times, as I've counseled with people, do we make bad decisions because we don't like the timing and the way that God is working in our lives? And this morning, I want to, or this evening, I want to bring a message to you entitled, The Dangers of Delay. I don't like delays. I like everything quick. And, and I, I'm guessing that many of you are like me. Waiting is not our strong suit. We, we want it quickly. You don't believe that's true. Take a look at the New York, New York Times bestsellers list through the years. We don't want to wait and work toward anything. What about our physical health, getting in shape? We don't want to wait or work toward getting in shape. There was a New York Times bestselling book entitled, Eight Minutes in the Morning. Here it is. A simple way to shed up to two pounds a week. Here it is. 
guaranteed. And then New York Times bestseller, The Plan. That, oh, go back. Why are we moving forward there? I'm still reading this cover. The Plan that guarantees rapid weight loss. And uh, this is the number one George Cruz weight loss specialist with more than 3 million clients. Why, why did this book sell so many? Because guess what? You tell me that I have to work out for an hour or two a day or eight minutes a day. Which workout are you taking? The eight minutes in the morning workout, right? You say, Pastor Ryan, how do you know that this book exists? Because I bought it about 15 years ago. And so if you're wondering what does the eight minute in the morning workout look like, you're looking at it right here. This is it. You too could have this physique for only eight. Actually, I don't do the eight minutes. In the, this is zero minutes in the morning. But, but for only eight minutes in the morning. A simple way to, this, that we don't want to work hard to change, uh, to get in shape. We, how can you give me a shortcut? Eight minutes in the morning. The same author wrote a book about changing our diet. It was also a New York Times bestseller. The three-hour diet. Lose up to 10 pounds in just two weeks by eating every three hours. That sounds pretty good to me. Instead of starving myself, just eat whenever I feel like. Every three hours I'm eating. So according to George... And, and I don't want to be too hard because I did read the first book and I did it for a little while, but I didn't stay with it, so maybe it would work. But according to George, all I have to do is work out eight minutes every morning and eat every three hours. Sounds like a good plan to me. How, how many of you are with me? Seems legit to me, but it's the shortcut. What's the, e here's the reality. To stay in good shape, to eat healthy, there is no shortcut. It's just hard work. It's being diligent. It's being consistent. It's working hard. We don't want to wait to get in shape. We don't want to work hard to change our diet. We don't want to wait for retirement. Another New York Times bestseller several years ago, the four-hour work week. Escape the nine to five, live anywhere, and join the new rich. Has sold millions of copies. It's been reprinted multiple times. Do any of you uh, on your social media, any friends, any neighbors, any relatives, any of you know anyone that read this book and is now working only four hours a week, living wherever they want rich? You know who's only working four hours a week? Timothy Ferris. That's who gets to work the four-hour work. He's probably working more than that too, by the way. But, but why does it sell? The idea that I could have something that for most people it's a lot of hard work, I could have it quickly. I don't want to wait. I don't want to work. I don't want to wait on that. And, and sadly, I believe that we treat God and his working in our lives in much the same way. When it comes to God's plans, when it comes to our spiritual lives, we don't like to wait. We hate it when we perceive a delay in how we think God should work everything out. What is God doing in this season of my life? What's the next stage? What's the answer going to be to that? I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I still don't have an answer. I didn't get the answer that I wanted. I, I really want this and I was really hoping for that. And God, what are you doing here? And how are you working in my marriage? And what are you doing in my life? And I'm single, God. What's next? And I'm in high school. And God, where are you? Show it all to me. Open all of those things. The Bible says thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path uh, in a dark place. What does a lamp do? It just shows you the next step. And often God illuminates the next step for us. But we don't want the next step illuminated, do we? We want the whole path illuminated. God, where is this all going to lead? How is this all going to work out? When are you going to come through for me? And when God delays, much like the children of Israel in Exodus chapter number 32, if we're not careful, we can do some really unwise and unhealthy things in our lives. It's going to be a little bit of a Bible study this evening. We're going to look at a, a few verses. But I want to ask you, is there something in your life where it seems as though God has delayed or is delaying? You thought by this point it would look different. You thought by this point in the situation, you would have the answers. And you feel like, God, what are you doing? Is there, is there something in your life where it seems that God has delayed? Here's the reality. Providential delays can often be times of great growth in our lives. They can be times of great blessing and great spiritual maturing in our lives. God often uses obstacles and delays in the Bible to prepare his people. Do you remember Moses? Long before he became the leader of millions of people, long before he was the redeemer of Israel, he was wandering around as a shepherd on the backside of a desert for decades. You know what I call that? A long time of delay. I want to be the redeemer. I want to be the, the leader. I want to, be, the, I want to be, be impacting multitudes of lives. No, go take care of some sheep where nobody's watching. 
And you'll find that all through Scripture, that often God uses times of delay and times that don't make sense to prepare us. But they can also be very dangerous times in our lives. If things haven't worked out the way you thought they would or in the time frame that you thought they should, it can be a dangerous thing in our faith. I want you to see Exodus chapter number 32, where we find ourselves in Exodus 32. Moses is up on the mountains and he's receiving the law. He's up getting the law of God. And it's the story of the golden calf. I think most of us are probably familiar with this story. It's a crazy story. In Exodus chapter number 32, I want you to see probably the craziest part to me is here. Look, beginning in verse number 2. Exodus 32, beginning in verse number 2. The Bible says, and Aaron, so Moses is gone. So Aaron, the assistant pastor, if you will, is in charge. And Aaron said unto them, break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings, which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. Here's the, one of the craziest verses in all of Scripture to my mind. Look at what it says, the last part of verse 4. And would you read from that word and to the end aloud. Ready? Begin. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Think about what that phrase means. These people that had seen God work in the ten plagues. They had seen frogs and lice and boils and darkness and water turn to blood. They had seen the, the Passover lamb, the death of the firstborn. These people that had seen God work in unbelief. You and I might say, if I had seen God deliver me in such a miraculous way, I would never doubt him again. By the way, we've seen him deliver us in a much more miraculous way by the shedding of blood of his only begotten son on the cross of Calvary. But they had seen this amazing God working in miracles. And God had brought them over. Then they, they had come to the Red Sea and they were there and they thought they were going to die. And they started getting mad against Moses and saying, you, you just brought us here because the graveyards weren't big enough in Egypt. They started getting, and what did God do? God opened up the Red Sea. I don't know if, they'll, if, if there's going to be a way to do this when we get to heaven. I would love to watch the video footage of the Red Sea crossing. I'd love to see that Bible story. They walked across on dry ground. They all got a million or two million Jews, got across with all their stuff. And then they looked back and the most powerful army on the face of the earth was completely enveloped by the, by the, the water going back over top of them. And th they had been there. They saw when Moses put his rod and the, they had seen that deliverance. They had seen that redemption. And you know how long it took for them not just to kind of start missing church a little bit, but to completely change religions, 39 days. And here's what they're doing. Hey guys, take your jewelry. Everybody bring me your jewelry. I got an idea. Moses is gone. God must have forgotten about us. We're talking about 39 days. I didn't say 39 years. God must have forgotten about us. It's been a month. God didn't answer our prayers. We don't know what's happening. Moses is gone. He must have taken off. Who knows? Hey, bring me all your jewelry, and I'm going to go ahead. And we, we made, they made a molten calf with jewelry they were wearing the day before. And the next day, you know what they were doing with that molten calf of jewelry they had made the day before? You know what they were doing? Here, it says it right there in verse number four. These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. That calf that we made yesterday, that's the God that delivered us from Egypt. How in the world? But if we're not careful, our faith can get shaken as well when God doesn't come through in the way we thought he would or the way we hoped that he would or the way that we wished and thought that he should. Amazing what we can convince ourselves with when things don't go according to our plan. Why did this happen? How did they get here? Well, all it was was God and their leader didn't do things when they thought they should be done. Would you read verse number 1 aloud, chapter 32, verse number 1. Let's read it aloud. Ready? Begin. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. What happened? Things didn't happen the way that they thought they should. You see that word? When the people saw that Moses delayed. By the way, 
did Moses really delay? Or was that just God's perfect timing? It was just their perspective. It didn't happen when they thought it should. God, if we're going to live for you and follow you, it needs to happen when I think it should in the ways that I think it should. And when it doesn't, if we're not careful, all of a sudden we start we start coming up with all kinds of different things. It's so dangerous in our lives. We're like the Israelites sometimes. We have a tendency to do some of the same things. So if God, if there's something in your life where it feels like, God, you're not working in the ways or in the timing that I thought you would or that I think you should, what are the things you need to be aware of? We have a tendency to do some of the same things. What are some of the dangers of delay with the children of Israel? Number one, I want you to hold your hand here. Turn back. We're going to come back to chapter 32. Turn back to chapter 14. We're going to look at a good bit of scripture here in chapters 14, 15, 16, and 17. A few verses in each chapter. I want you to see it. And actually, while you go to chapter 14, I said, hold your hand there before, go right back to 32. Hold your hand in 14, go right back to 32. What's the, what's the first danger of delay? Notice what it says. And when the people saw that Moses, in verse 1 of chapter 32, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, up. Make us gods which shall go before us, for as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. What's the first thing that can happen, or one of the things that can happen when God doesn't work? Number one, we murmur. We get together with other people and we start to question God and his plan. We start to even question spiritual leadership in our lives. Well, why did they handle it that way? And why is that going that way? And what's happening there? And, and this, this Moses, as for this Moses, it almost feels when I read it like this, as for that guy, the one that brought us out of Egypt, who knows what happened to him? And they gathered themselves together. They began to murmur. Now skip back to chapter 14. Look at verse number 11. This is another time. There were multiple times when God delayed in, in according to what they thought it should have been. Look in chapter number 14 as they come in chapter number 14 and, and we see them being delayed, if you will. Chapter 14, verse number 11, there at the Red Sea it says, and they said unto Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt that was taken us away to die in the wilderness, wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Verse 12, is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. We talked about this a couple Sunday nights ago, the curse of complaining, but what was their, when delay came, what was their response? Hey, Moses, why'd you bring us out here? They didn't have enough graves in Egypt? Why'd you bring us out here? Didn't we tell you we'd rather stay in Egypt? Now, number one, that wasn't true. They didn't tell Moses that. They actually said, please get us out of here. But when God doesn't work in the ways we want, it's amazing the revisionist history we can come up with in our own minds. Look at, if you will, at, at, uh, uh, skip down to verse number 21, it says, And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land, and waters were divided. So what happens? We get to verse 21, and what happens? God opens it up. Delay comes. We murmur. God opens it up. Skip down to verse number 31. Verse 31, please. The last chapter, a uh, verse of the chapter. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. Here it is. Would you read the rest of the verse with me aloud? And the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. God comes through. Man, it's a good thing being a child of God, isn't it? We fear the Lord. We believe the Lord. Moses, long live Moses. You're the man, Moses. We're going to build a statue of you. We love you, Moses. Moses. They're, they're on their social media. Moses is the best. He got us across the Red Sea. Now let's look at the next verse. Chapter 15, verse number 1. Then sang Moses, um, uh, verse number 1, then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously the horse, and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. He is my God. I will prepare him in habitation. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. What are they doing? They're writing new songs to sing in church. And I'm using New Testament terms, I get it. But they're writing new songs to sing about the crossing of the Red Sea. God's so good to us. Skip down to verse number 24. Uh, verse 23, I'm sorry. And when they came to Mara, they could not drink of the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Mara 
Would you read the first four words of verse 24? Ready, begin. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? And the people murmured. Did you guys see my new song I wrote about the crossing of the Red Sea? Forget that song, Moses. What, what is, what's with you? What's with this God we're serving? I tried to get, he brought us across here just to kill us here. Now we're all going to die of thirst. And the people murmured. Why? Because God didn't work the way they thought he should and in the time frame that they thought he would. Skip down to the next verse, chapter 16. Look, and you can go back and read all of this in context for the sake of time. I'm pulling out a few verses. Look at chapter 16, verse number 2. The Bible says, And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Verse 3, And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the, the ones that wrote the song about how good God is. You see it in verse 2. He's my strength. He's my song. He's my salvation. Now he's my murderer. It's kind of what they thought. And would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots, when we did eat bread to the full. For you have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. First we're going to die by the Egyptian army. Then we're going to die of thirst. Now we're going to die of hunger. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. Okay, I came through at the Red Sea, and I'll come, I came through with water from the rock and I'll come through with manna. And then chapter number 17, look at chapter 17, verse number 2. Chapter number 17, in verse 1, there's no water for the people to drink again. By the way, had they ever been in a spot where there was no water before? Talk to me, church. Had they ever been in that spot before? Just a chapter or two ago, right? You think they would have learned to trust that maybe God's ways and God's timing and God's strength is good enough to believe in? That he's worthy to trust with your life? But oh no. No water. And look at verse number two. Wherefore, the people did chide with Moses and said, give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, why chide ye with, with me? What are you upset with me for? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And notice this. And the people murmured against Moses and said, wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us? in our children, in our cattle with thirst. What happens when God doesn't work on our time frame? If we're not careful, we forget all of the good things he's done, all about our deliverance, all about his strong arm in our lives, all about his miraculous protection and his miraculous provision. And if we're not careful, all we do is look back and say, why did I ever give my life to God anyways? Look at those that aren't serving God. It would have been better to be back in Egypt. It would have been better to be back in bondage. We, we were Life was so good there. And if we're not careful, Careful when God delays our first response is we begin to murmur and complain against God and his working in our lives and his leadership in our lives. We begin to complain about those that have tried to help us and to guide us. And God, why did you let it happen this way? And why did you put me in a spot there where I was a little thirsty and, and where some of my struggles there? Why did you put us in a dangerous position at the Red Sea? And, and when God comes through, we sing his praises. And when seemingly, by the way, God always did come through, but at the moment it seemed like he wasn't coming through, we then give up all hope. Forget it. Why am I even living for him? Let me just go back to Egypt, a picture of the world. Let me just go back to the world. What, God, you didn't open the right door there. My wife and I, we've been working so hard. We've been praying for that, uh, uh, for a young adult, for a college-age student, for a young couple, for a middle-aged single person, whatever the case may be. All of us have things in our lives. You live long enough where you look back and say, I thought it was going to be a little different than this. I thought it was going to work out. I thought God was going to answer that prayer a little differently, and I thought maybe I'd be in a different spot, and I thought that, that he would have guided me here. And if we're not careful, when he delays, we think it's a delay. If we're not careful, we'll begin to murmur against God and his work and his plans in our lives. Turn back to 32, if you will, where we started. But not only is there a danger to murmur, but number two, we mingle. Look at verse number 1, chapter 32. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together. The people gathered themselves together. I don't know how that happened, 
But I don't know if they, they, they had people like signing ballots. Hey, we're upset. They're standing in front of the grocery store there, out there in the wilderness. And would you sign this ballot? Moses isn't coming down from the mount. We want new gods to worship. I don't know how it happened. But somewhere, I just, you have to think about it logically. Somewhere, enough people started murmuring that then a small group of people started complaining. And, hey, have you seen Moses? What's God doing? What's, are we all going to die out here? Where are we going? Aaron's not really that good of a leader, is he? Well, what, what's, what's happening? And some, the Bible says they gathered themselves together. Some people that were upset with how God was working found some other people that were upset with how God was working, and they gathered themselves together. And I don't know, the Bible doesn't give us all the details of it, but just again, logically, somewhere along the way, some group of people decided, here's the answer, let's go tell Aaron, we're going to revolt, we need a new God to worship. And they came, the people, they started getting around other people that were dissatisfied with what God was doing in their lives and in their families and in their nation. And they started spending time with the wrong folks. And for us, maybe it's online or in school or at work, it started small because I don't think they just made an announcement to millions of people and said, all of them at one time just said, oh, let's get new gods. Somewhere they began to gather themselves together and it started small. And before you know it, you've got millions of people saying, we are done with Moses. We need a new God to worship. They began to get, and it's amazing when God doesn't operate the way you think he should, and, and maybe you're upset or you're frustrated, who you'll surround yourself with to tell you what you want to hear. And before you know it, you're coming up with all kinds of plans that are not healthy and not wise in your lives. And that leads me to number three, what happens in our lives? We murmur and we mingle, and then thirdly, we manufacture. We start coming up with our own solutions to try to work it out. Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for Moses, we don't know where he is. Skip down to verse number 6. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. What did they do? They came and began sacrificing to a golden calf that Aaron had made out of their jewelry the day before. Isn't it amazing the plans we can come up with and we can justify in our minds, this is the right next step for me because we're tired of waiting on God. God, I'm tired of waiting for you to guide and direct, for you to open the doors. I'm going to kick a door open. I'm going to kick a door down. This is what it is, and this is what's going to work. And they, they, they all convinced themselves. They were all bringing their families. All right, kids, it's time to go worship. Oh, we're going to the temple. No, we don't, we don't do that anymore. We're going to go. We got a new God. A new God? Yeah, what, what about, hey, mom, what about the God that you wrote that song about? Oh, no, 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 no. no. What about the God that brought us through the Red Sea? No, 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 no. No, we don't sing that song anymore, son. Why? It's been a month. God didn't come through for us for 39 days. It's time for a new God. And they came and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings to the golden calf. I need to figure this out for God. I need to move. I need to figure out how to get married. I need to figure out the next job offer. I need to figure out the next location. I need to answer this prayer. I've got to do something. I, I've got to figure it out. That must be the answer. I've got to find the answer. I can't wait anymore on God. It's taking too long, and it's not looking the way that I thought it would. And then lastly, what do we do? Look at verses 7 and 8. We move quickly away from God. Look at verse 7. And the Lord said unto Moses, Moses is up there communing with the God of the universe. He's up there communing with the Lord. The Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt. I don't know, I, sometimes I read it, I don't know if it's meant to be this way, but I kind of view it. It's funny when you watch God and Moses talking to each other sometimes, sometimes they feel like parents. Your son. Your daughter, here God says to Moses, your people, maybe that's not how it's supposed to be in temple. When I read it, I kind of read it that way. Thy people, which you brought out of Egypt. God's saying, kind of, anybody ever done that? Where, hey, honey, your, you need to go deal with your son right now, all right? Why is he my son right now? How come he's always my son when it needs to be dealt with? And, and he says, thy people, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. Look at this, verse number 8. Would you read the first five words of verse number eight aloud? Ready, begin. They have turned aside. One more time. They have turned aside quickly. God looks at Moses. 
It's gone fast, Moses. They turned aside quickly. I've only been up here for a month. Moses, it's time to get down. Those people you brought out of Egypt, they've corrupted themselves. They've made some really foolish decisions. They're teaching their kids some really foolish doctrine. They're they're, they're doing some really foolish things. They've turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. And they go back and forth. And one, one per, I heard one pastor say, if God and Moses ever got on the same page, Israel would have been wiped out. There are times where Moses says, just kill him. And God says, oh no, I don't want to kill him. Other times God's like, I'm ready to kill him. And Moses says, show some mercy. And they go back and forth together. But they turned aside quickly. They moved away from God in 39 days. Their worship completely changed. By the way, it doesn't mean that they, they sang a new song. We saw they sang a new song when their worship was right. What it means is they completely started worshiping a new Savior, a new God, a new Redeemer. No longer was it the God of Israel that redeemed them. It was a calf they made with their own hands. They started worshiping the, the work of their own hands. They stopped worshiping the God of the universe and started worshiping the work of their own hands. They started worshiping their own ideas. They started worshiping their own plans. They started worshiping their own, here's how it's going to work for my future. Here's how we're going to get out of this mess. They started worshiping really themselves, this golden calf, and they stopped their worship change and their music change and their dress change and all of these things. They're moving quickly away from God and, and they moved away quickly and may I just stop and say these four things can be a danger for every one of us when life doesn't take the path the exact path that we thought it might take when it takes a detour we didn't expect it to take when it doesn't look like what we thought it would look like when God doesn't answer in the ways we thought he would answer if we're not careful we'll begin to murmur instead of praising him instead of what we sang this morning you give you take away, I'll choose to say, blessed be your name, we begin to say, you just want to kill us? We murmur, we mingle, we'll start surrounding ourselves with other people that doubt what God's doing. And we'll start bouncing off ideas, yeah, that's a great idea, you should, we should go make a new God and you should worship, yeah, that's a great idea, go try that, go do that. And and we'll find counsel that will confirm what we want, we'll begin to manufacture, we'll make up our own plan and our own ideas and, and it'll sound good to a lot of people around us, but instead of waiting on God, instead of praying, instead of resting in God, we'll do those things and then we'll move quickly, if we're not careful, away from God. We must guard during the seasons of delay, but we must say, God, I'm not going to be in control. I'm going to let you be in control. What should the children of Israel have done? Last place we'll turn, back to Exodus 14. I had you hold your hand in 32, and we went back to 14 to see it. You know, the first time that God ever delayed, they were given the formula of what they should do every time he delayed. The first time that God had ever delayed for them after their redemption, God gave them the formula that they should have followed all the subsequent times of delay in their lives. And I believe it's a great formula for us when God isn't working in quite the ways that we had hoped or thought that he would. Exodus chapter number 14 at the Red Sea. I want you to see what Moses, so they're they're saying, didn't we tell you? that it would be better to leave us in Egypt, the Red Sea, the Egyptian army is bearing down their necks. They're looking, and the most powerful army on the face of the earth is is barreling down toward them. They are in a spot. They can't go to their right. They can't go to their left. They can't go forward at the Red Sea. The only place they can go is back, and, 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 and trained killers are following them, are coming, bearing down. It's just a countdown to their death. And this is where they said, Moses, what was the deal? You brought us out here because we didn't have big enough cemeteries? Life was so much better in Egypt. And look at what God, the plan God gave through his man in verse 13. Would you read it aloud with me? Exodus 14, verse 13. Ready? Begin. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians who ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. He said, fear you not. What's the opposite of fear? Faith. What did he say? In your seasons of delay, 
trust God. Stand still, what did he say? He said, wait on God and see, what did he say? Watch God. What did he tell them in our seasons of delay? What should we do? Fear ye not, trust God. What are you scared of? Has he not redeemed you with a mighty hand? Has he not provided water from the rock in your life? Has he not given you daily manna to this point? Is he not trustworthy in your life? Fear ye not, trust God. But I don't know, it's been a month. It's been a year. It's been a decade. I thought life was going to look different. Fear ye not. God's in control. Trust God. Stand still. Wait on God. You don't have to make it all happen. You don't have to manufacture it. You don't have to go figure it all out and knock doors open. No, no, knock doors down. I often pray when I'm facing a big decision in my life. I'll often pray, God, give me the faith. Uh, give me the faith to walk through an open door. Because you know what happens sometimes? God opens a door for us and it's a little scary and we get cold feet and we don't want to step through an open door because it's scary. But then I'll also pray, but God, give me the wisdom not to kick down a door that isn't open. Because I can convince myself just about any door that there's a little crack. Well, that's the door God wants me to go through. I can be impulsive. I'm a little bit of an impulsive personality. I can, I can, I can do those things. You know what I need to do? Like Moses, when God's delaying, probably I need to err on the side of Stand still. Stay where you're supposed to be. Do what you're supposed to do. Work on being who you're supposed to be. And God will come along and open the doors that he needs to open at the times he needs to open them. Trust God. Wait on God. Fear you not. Stand still. And then what did he see? say? See the salvation of the Lord. And watch God work. Trust that God will work. Wait on God to work. And if you will, you'll watch and see God work in your life. Here's the reality. All of us will walk through desert places, wilderness seasons of life where we don't know how God's working. We don't know what he's doing. We don't know why he's doing what he's doing. And Satan will try to use these desert places to discourage you. God wants to use these places to develop you. These times of waiting. These times of not having the answers. These times of not knowing what it's going to look like a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, a decade from now. Satan wants to use those to discourage you. God wants to use them to develop you, to draw you closer to him, to show himself strong in your life. But that can't happen if you take the path that the Israelites did to murmur and to mingle and to manufacture and to move quickly away from God. No, let's, let's go back the first time they faced the delay and let's follow that formula in the area that we can't quite figure out. Fear ye not. You know, it's often fear of the unknown of the future that drives us to make really bad decisions. I don't know what's going to happen there, so I'm just going to do something. Fear ye not. I'm not scared of what the future looks like. I'm going to stand still. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to wait on you, and I'm going to trust that I will see the salvation of the Lord. I'm going to watch you work on your timetable. If you're anything like your pastor, you probably don't like to wait. You probably want all the answers, and you want them yesterday. Not even today, yesterday. You want to know what it's all going to look like, how it's all going to work out. But God doesn't always operate that way, does he? But he does always. When we let him work, he works in ways that we can trust. And in ways that are best for us in the long run. Let's learn from the children of Israel. Lord, I thank you for these truths found in your word. And I thank you for your people. And I pray, dear God, that each one of us would take these thoughts to heart and really take inventory. Is there an area where we wish God would work a little differently or a little quick, more quickly? And God, in those ways, I pray that we would learn from the mistakes that the children of Israel made over and over and over again. And that God, in those places, we would go back to that Red Sea experience when you delivered us with a mighty hand. And we would remember that we can trust you. That we can stand still and let you move in the ways you want to move. Lord, help us not to think we've got to figure it all out and we've got to make it all work. But God, help us to trust your plan and your timing and your work, not the works of our own hands, 
not our own ideas, not what, what our other carnal friends came up with with us. Help us to trust you and your plan and your word and the spiritual leadership in our lives, I pray. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, we'll stand together. The altar is open as Jerry begins to play the piano. If you'd like to come forward and pray, maybe you just want to pray that God would give you the strength and the faith in a season of waiting in your life. That God would help you to trust him when you can't trace him. To let him work when you don't know how he's working, when you don't understand. The altar is open if you'd like to come forward and pray. Let's learn from the children of Israel about these dangers of delay. Lord, I thank you for your word and for even the lyrics of that song to stand still and let you move. Help all of us, dear God, this week to rest in you, to trust you, to watch you work in your ways and in your timing because that's always what's best for us. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. As Jerry Elba continues to play that song, Janine, do you know that song, the lyrics to that song? Do you not? I'm putting people on the spot here. I have, I have the lyrics up here if you think you know the song, and we'll all be very forgiving if you mess something up. Do you mind coming and singing that while Jerry L. plays it? And uh, anybody else? I was going to ask Sharice, too, if she knew it. I'm not sure where Sharice is, if Sharice knows it. But a uh, beautiful song that has great lyrics there. The Father has a plan, and though it's hard to see it now, I want you to listen to these words. I'll let you be seated right there. And when she's done singing, we'll be dismissed here in just a moment. And thank you for letting me put you on the spot there. And uh, just remember, we're going to let you be seated. <laughs> it's all right. All right, let's listen to Jeannie as she sings this.
Let's strive to live that. It's easier to say than to do, isn't it? Let's strive to live that this week. Aren't you glad you came to church tonight? I sure am. The Lord spoke to my heart through the singing and through his word. I believe we have popsicles that are set up out there, and you can enjoy those. A beautiful evening hanging out in the courtyard, and the kids can play out in the grass and the playground and things. And a Wednesday night is the last night of our community groups for this um, session. Um, the following Wednesday is our school graduations. And then uh, two weeks from this Tuesday, we kick off our summer preaching series. We move our midweek service from Wednesday to Tuesday for 12 weeks. We'll have dinner together at 530. And then we have 12 different pastors coming from um, mostly Southern California. One from Las Vegas, one from Kansas. The other ones are all from Southern California. that will be here on each Tuesday night. A different pastor will be preaching. And we did this last summer, a great time of fellowship with the church family. We'll have the jump houses set up out there for the kids to enjoy each Sunday night. And it's a half an hour early earlier this year, so I'll have a half an hour of extra light afterwards for everybody, and just a wonderful time with our church family every Tuesday night of the summer. So this Wednesday night, don't miss our last Wednesday night of community groups. Be here and enjoy that time together, and then we'll move into our summer preaching series on Tuesday evenings. I believe that's all that I need to make mention of. Um, I don't think there's anything else that I mentioned. Two weeks from today, plan to be a part of that Memorial Day barbecue. We'll look forward to a great time of fellowship together. This week, let's try to live from the rest that we have in Christ. And let's trust Him when we can't trace Him. This week, may our words, our thoughts, and our actions please Christ. God bless you. meeting. Deacons, if you're in here, we'll meet upstairs in about five minutes. A brief deacons meeting in about five minutes upstairs.